Okay. How are you? Welcome to our weekly happy hour with the LPO. My name is Carlos Miguel Prieto and I'm music director of this fabulous orchestra. And I am joined today by the percussion section of the LPO. Jim Atwood, Jacob Powers, and Dave Saleh. So uh, I, I have so many questions and anecdotes to share. I'll try to do it within our allotted time. But I'd like to first uh, greet Jim. This is our second time doing this. You were actually the first in the first uh, week. Uh, and now we're back. How are you, Jim? We're fine. We enjoyed it the first week. We were the guinea pigs for this, but that was okay. Mm -hmm. I had a good time. It's good to be back again. I've enjoyed seeing you do, do this with my colleagues. And uh, I'm so glad you're doing this. It's fun to get to see everyone, even though we can't be in the same room at the same time. That's right. And Jacob, how are you? Doing good, yeah. Just uh, got plenty of dogs and carbs to keep me company still. So, <laughs> <laughs> Dave, how are you doing? I'm doing good here. Just trying to stay busy and make the best of things while we deal with this. Yeah, well, I'm in Mexico City. You are all in New Orleans. And uh, is it is it very hot there yet? It's getting there. It's getting there. It's yeah, getting it's pretty there. hot. All right. Well, the first thing I wanted to ask you is, um, one of the constant things that we've done over the last years are pieces that have unusual percussion instruments. And by unusual, I mean unusual in the orchestral setting. So the question that I wanted to ask you, because all three of you are actually examples of musicians who went through great conservatories, who had great teachers, you went through the audition process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yet uh, in your work in the orchestra, you have had to play and sometimes even to learn instruments that you perhaps did not encounter in conservatory. So I've had a couple of uh, interviews with colleagues of yours, uh, one with uh, Fernando Mesa from Minnesota, one from uh, win, one with Gabriela Jimenez from here from Mexico, and I've asked them this issue: Is it why aren't uh, some percussion instruments taught at conservatories or used in audition? And I'm talking about uh, percussion instruments that may be um, unknown, but for some places are very well known. So I'll ask, I'll start by asking Jacob because of your uh, familiar uh, familiarity with Brazil. Is pandeiro, which is a kind of Brazilian snare drum, is that something that kids learn in conservatory or is that something that you have to go to Brazil to learn? It's not something that I learned in conservatory. I think you need to go. <laughs> you need to go to Brazil. First off, it's kind of hard to get one in America. And it, the, the pandeiro is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a very much an instrument of the, of the people. You know, it's like when you're at home with your family and somebody pulls out a guitar, a cajon, and somebody comes around the corner with the pandero. So I think for that instrument and most instruments from that are not the classical ones, like to go there, of course the best way to learn about it and familiarize yourself is to go, to go there, immerse yourself and really get a feel for what it's about. Uh, but there's no pandero classes at percussion conservatory in America. <laughs> I, I had a Loyola a few years ago that uh, very unexpectedly got a grant to spend a semester uh, in Brazil. And uh, and so he said, when he got down there, he sent me a couple of uh, emails and he said, the first thing he was told was, you have to learn the pandero. 
<laughs> it's like no one would pay any attention to him until he could play Pandero. I mean, he was just like, uh, you know, from outer space until he learned to play the Pandero. And which he did. When he came back, I couldn't believe it. And he played it really well. It, it was as if he came back and suddenly could speak fluent Russian. It, I was amazed. But that's what he had to do to get accepted into the herd down there. Yeah. And uh, Dave, through your time in New Orleans, have you had to learn like a unique instrument and, and especially unique to Louisiana? Have you, uh, have you had to play anything that you hadn't played before in conservatory and what? Uh, as far as unique to Louisiana, probably not. M maybe a Cajun triangle. What's a Cajun triangle? Well, I, it's a really big triangle that is, yeah, very, very metallic uh, and, and kind of more on the dry uh, side of things where it doesn't ring that much. Much thicker. Yeah. And wh wh what kind of music is it used for? Uh, boy, when we do... I don't know, Jacob. Can you remember when we used that last? Uh, we used we used it last um, for there was a spot in Bela Flex concerto, and that, that but that's the that's the only time that we've used it to try to emulate something from Louisiana. We've used it in different other pieces, but um, you know we don't do much Zydeco <laughs> or you know Cajun waltzes where that 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 triangle is found a lot yeah it's it's a staple the cajun triangle is a staple part of the rhythm section and the cajun dance really it's almost like one of the drum instruments i remember that when we did the uh winton marsalis do you remember this the the, the piece that we did along with a uh, soldier's tale so i'll 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 kind of share with our audience the, the following anecdote uh it it was our idea to program along with Stravinsky, L'Histoire du Soldat, Soldier's Tale, which is a piece that uh, especially um, percussionists know very well because uh, I understand that the, the drum part is, is, is very well known and used in auditions, especially the end. Um, yet, when I programmed that, I never thought that it would have uh, that it would make Jacob learn a completely new instrument. And when I started studying that piece, I started thinking, what, what is Jacob, Jacob going to do? Is he going to try to use like a standard percussion instrument to imitate? Uh, yet you learned an instrument that is an essential Zydeco instrument. Can you sh share with us this anecdote? How long did it take you? Did you did you get a lesson or did you just learn it on your own? So you're talking about the, the Fiddler's Tale. Fiddler's by Tale by Winter Marsalis, yes. Yeah, so in that part, there's a pretty, there's a, a part, there's a washboard part that comes back um, over and over again. So I don't have a washboard. So I got online and found, I think Columbus, Ohio, it's the Columbus Washboard Company. They're the last uh, boutique or not mass produced in China washboard company in America. So I got the musical washboard, not the regular one, the musical one. And I, uh, it came and I just, you know, got on YouTube as, as you do now and watched a bunch of videos of people playing. On YouTube, you can slow things down half time, three quarters time, so I could really mimic the movements. And then once you once I had the movement down, and I just listened to enough music to try to get the feel right. And it's not, it wasn't perfect, but as long as I could make it feel kind of like it's supposed to feel, that's that's my job. Because you know, we, we have like two months to learn it. You can't you can't master the washboard in two months. Maybe some people could, but I couldn't. So. <laughs> And uh, Jim, one, one thing I, I wanted to ask you, because uh, ever since I, I went the first time to New Orleans, I, I noticed that you have a very distinct, unique sound in your timpani playing. 
And uh, I later found out, well, that's not only who you studied with and your schooling and you know your own technique, uh, it's also that that uh, you you use for a certain repertoire some calfskin uh, heads. And uh, we've talked about this a lot, but maybe you can share with the audience. Um, if, if you don't mind like telling us wh who was your teacher, because as I understand it, it's a, it's a like a legendary teacher. And, and second about this, uh, what is it so unique about the calf skins and where do you get them from? Well, then my teacher was Cloyd Duff with the Cleveland Orchestra. He was George Zell's timpanist for almost 40 years there. And, um, Cloyd Duff had this very special sound, which he had sort of worked with uh, with George Zell. Uh, George Zell kept bothering him. This is early in his career, back in the 1940s, when conductors were still allowed to bother people about yeah. the sound. And uh, and so Zell and Duff worked on this sound. It was a sound that uh, I would describe as very bright and blending, as opposed to punching through the orchestra. Anyway. It, there's definitely a school of playing that's built around Cloyd Duff. And um, about 20 years ago, I had a chance to get a pair of instruments, or it's actually a set of instruments that were like Duff's. Duff's came, uh, he bought his in 1938. Uh, they came from Dresden, Germany. And uh, so I was able to buy a set just like his. And they came with caskin heads. Up until the 1960s, all timpani players played on calfskin heads. And the calfskin head thing is a very special sound, aside from the drums, which had a very special sound of their own. Uh, so the combination of those two uh, is exactly sort of the sound I was looking for. I was lucky to find the instruments. The calfskin heads now are sort of making a resurgence in orchestras. When Even when I got my drums in 1990, I guess, or 92, there were not that many orchestras that were using calfskin heads, but now all the big orchestras use calfskin heads and a lot of the smaller orchestras. It's a very special sound. It's a very blending sound. I describe it as very cello-like and bass-like rather than drum-like. So that's the timpani story. And then last year I had a chance to buy another pair of timpani, and mine were from 1937 that I bought now. So now I have a lot of timpani and nor can they play. <laughs> well, what, what about um, that, that famous uh, recording of uh, Cleveland Orchestra doing da uh, Death and Transfiguration where I, I believe it's Cloyd Duff who makes this like celestial sound on the timpani. What, and and if, any, if anyone uh, cares to listen to this, this is one of the glorious recordings of all time. Cleveland Orchestra playing Richard Strauss and whoever the timpanist is, which I imagine is Cloyd Duff, makes the most amazing sound um, in this piece in Death and Transfiguration. W would that have been the type of drums like you own and the calfskin heads also? Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, that was a recording on his old uh, German drums. And that is a gorgeous recording. Interestingly enough, that's based on CD. I, a few years ago, I found a, an old LP of that recording. And the sound on the LP is even better, actually. The timpani sound is, uh, as you described, is absolutely glorious. And Dave, I, I, I want to ask you, because I, I have very clear memory uh, of your audition. And I remember. I, it, I remember that you played, I think, every single instrument that was on stage for your audition, for the final at least. And yet I know this, Jacob knows this, Jim knows this, yet our audience probably imagines that, well, uh, in order to get in an orchestra, you either have to play well snare drum or you have to be good at the triangle, but share with us if you remember, how many different percussion instruments were, were you asked to play in the final and semi-final round of your audition? Uh, well, quite a few. Uh, there's always the standard of xylophone and snare drum and bells. 
Uh, then there's going to be tambourine, uh, cymbals, vibraphone, and bass drum. That, that means that was it. And, and marimba. You did play marimba. Yeah? We didn't have marimba. No. Well, okay. And uh, so of those eight instruments, if I had to ask you right now, okay, what's the excerpt that you'd least like to be asked if you have a round where there's two people, okay, two people, you and somebody else, and that round is just going to be one instrument. What is the thing that you will never want to see on that round? Uh, probably um, the uh, Messian exotic bird, uh, <laughs> the glockenspiel part. <laughs> I, I would say that is something that I don't, I don't want to play. <laughs> what about you, Jacob? Uh, I think a, a symbol part. And what, which piece? Mm. I'd say Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto Number Two. Well, and if if again, part of this is also to share with our audience what's unique about these things. So we ask Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto Number Two. Well, because we need a sound on symbols that is exactly the opposite from what everyone expects the symbols to sound like, okay? So you all know that symbols, there's a symbol crash, which I, I actually tried once and I was, it was like one of the worst experiences of my life and I will never try it again. And, uh, but that piece, Rahmanov Piano Concerto number two, which shows up quite often, what did you say? Probably too often. And that passage has the softest and also most exposed uh, symbol uh, crashes. And then we, we sometimes ask for Chaik 4, Tchaikovsky 4, which has loud uh, symbol crashes that go very fast. Um, so, can you tell me what's harder to play that Rachmaninoff 2 excerpt or to play the Chike 4 excerpt? Yes, Jacob. For me, in a final round, in a later round of an audition, I think that the Rachmaninoff is more difficult to judge. It's not necessarily more difficult to play, but because it's so quiet, it's so exposed. If you know, the, peop the people, the panel are singing the tune in their head. <laughs> you have to make, you have to make s soft crashes. The smaller the symbols get, the less satisfying they are to listen to and play. So, you have to judge how to get a super quiet, ethereal sound that will blend in with the piano. Um, but also finding the right metal to make that happen alone. It's a lot easier to do when you have the strings and the horns and everybody's there to kind of soften the blow. But when you're alone and everybody's just sitting there waiting for you to play, like making that atmosphere, I think is a hundred times harder than coming out and rocking out on Chike 4. <laughs> and Jim, since, since, uh, um, I know you from a long time ago, and we've done so much, so many pieces in the orchestra that use guido, that use maracas, that use these instruments. Um, yet that's not something that is required in many auditions. So would it be like sacrilegious to put like a guiro passage from uh, whatever from Huapango in a, in a, um, in an audition and then to ask candidates to play Venezuelan maracas. It, it, is that, is that something that will ever happen or are we going to be stuck? I, I use the word stuck in a very, uh, respectful manner, but 
if, if you agree with me, the repertoire used for, for percussion auditions pretty much stops at the middle of the last century, if at all. Okay, even Oiseau Exotique, which uh, you mentioned, well, that's a piece that's, that's getting up there in, a, in, in age, yet we are obsessed about playing new music and playing music uh, that that's sometimes uh, has an autochthonous feeling. So why, why is it that uh, instruments like guiro or cajon or these, why aren't they part of what orchestras require? And a lot of it, I think, is tradition. I think a lot of it is because uh, the people that are teaching in conservatories have done the same thing we've all done for 50 years or 100 years. They've learned all the standard orchestral excerpts and uh, and probably they don't think it's important, uh, maybe, or maybe they're just not good at those instruments or, or confident at those instruments. So many of these instruments, we all had to learn on our own, absolutely by ourselves, because uh, there was not a guiro teacher i can remember the first time i saw a guiro master play the instrument and i thought whoa it had nothing to do with what i think about guiro or what i could do on guiro uh and all the instruments really all uh, after you get out of the standard orchestral instruments all those other instruments are just as specialized as uh the xylophone or anything else and until we have teachers in the conservatories that come in and teach those instruments I think it'll sort of we'll stay within our comfort zone, uh, learning yet, these on our own. Yet you agree that uh, a, a a growing percentage of the music that we play uh, uses uh, so many um, so many let's say instruments that are that are used in in bands or in 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 autochthonous groups, and I I always worry about this because I get the other side, which is to be in front of you. And sometimes I go with an, an, an orchestra in, a, in Germany and where they see Guido and they have these plastic things. Uh, I even remember the brand is called Meinen, which is a very highly respected brand. But it's to me, that thing sounds as if I'm having a jambalaya in um, in New Zealand, you know, and I love New Zealand and I ju love jambalaya, but it's not gonna taste the same. So uh, that, that's a very interesting thing because the, the orchestras have such care about, you know, these few instruments, uh, yet I, I've hardly ever seen, uh, let's say I, I have seen in, in a growing number, but the traditional thing is that people look at these instruments and they go what and they 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 fall on kind of imitation instruments which by the way are much more expensive than the original uh, because one of these mining thing things may be worth how, how much are they worth dave do you know well, i mean 60 dollars probably okay 60 dollars i i i will I, I can assure you if I drive to a little town in Mexico and find somebody to carve me a guiro, it's going to cost me maximum three to four dollars, maximum, yeah. okay? And I could probably ask that gentleman to make me 20 of them. And, you know, he'll say, okay, then, then I'll bring the price down to two dollars or something. And um, it's, it's, for me, it's interesting because, uh, you know, our orchestras, we, we want to, we want to be in, the, in touch with our times, yet, yet we are not always doing this, uh, in, a, in a good way. The LPO and you guys, and that's why I wanted to touch upon this, are, have, are really very special because you have found instruments. I don't know where you find these things, but you found amazing instruments like uh, you know the 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 cajon that we used so a couple of years ago. I remember asking you, Jacob, because you I think you you know you told me you had found this instrument. So uh, how do you do it? Uh, how how do you find these instruments? Do you go in the on the internet, or do you have like are there dealers of 
fine weird instruments or <laughs> so I, I think most percussionists yeah. are always on the lookout for instruments it yeah. used to be pawn shops when orchestras toured uh, the standard thing was on the day off the percussionists would go down to the local pawn shops and see what they had and sometimes you'd find a brilliant instrument there you know it, it's interesting to me that you're talking about the guiro because i can remember from the very beginning of when you started here whenever we would have a piece with guiro you <laughs> going to say something about the guiro and you're probably going to come back in the break and uh, look at what everybody's doing and uh, from that moment on every time we had an extra that came in and i saw the extra pick up the guiro i thought oh no carlos is going to come back and ask about the guiro again tell everybody about the story of the old man playing guiro that you played conducted in florida that you were scared to death about well the old man uh, it it it's 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 a uh, well it's uh, I'll tell the story um, and it's 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 an emotional one now but uh, what happens to me is that I I get to conduct very often some pieces that have a lot of these percussion instruments and I've assembled through my travels through especially Latin America um, but sometimes also also in Europe, assembled some unique instruments that, that I bring with myself when we do a piece like the Night of the Mayas, which we'll talk about when we, you know, when we talk about our, our Carnegie Hall concert. But that piece that has 13 percussionists or, or more has some very unique instruments. And I know that the second movement, which is called Noche de Jaranas, is basically uh, led by the guiro player because the guiro player is is always playing these mixed meters so for people who don't know mixed meters it's just instead of being one two one two it's one two one two one two one two one something like that so uh the first thing i see when when i walk on stage in naples um is this gentleman who looked to me like the epitome of somebody who could not play guiro OK, and I'm sorry because, you know, it's it's there are these stereotypes and it's it's horrendous, but it only takes one time for somebody to teach you how wrong you are with these stereotypes. So we get to the second movement of Noche de Jaranas and this dude is rocking. I mean, he is like doing every single thing I wanted that person to be doing on Guiro. And it was it was just absolutely sensational. And in that same program, that exact same program, uh, there was Lavals. And in Lavals, that gentleman played bass drum. Now that's a more standard thing. And the sound he produced and the way the orchestra reacted to those downbeats with the bass drum, it was just something that gives me goosebumps just to think of that. And that gentleman was, Mr. Abel. So uh, that is one of the memories that I always have in my mind because I, I struck a friendship with, with this amazing man, amazing teacher. He also taught some, some musicians, friends of mine, and also uh, became their mentor. He was somebody who understood that a kid coming from Mexico was at a disadvantage at not speaking English or not being as proficient in some things, but the talent was there. And just for me to think about him makes me emotional. And I you know, maybe wanted to share that story uh, because it was the epitome of what you don't imagine happens, which is somebody who is from another country, understanding the music from your country better than you can even dream of somebody understanding. This has happened to me many, many times in Louisiana, thanks to you, because you guys are, I would say, as ideal combination as I have ever found of academically trained sensational musicians, plus uh, you play music that is of a more, let's say, less traditional nature, 
very, very well. And I'd like to ask you if this is something where living in New Orleans makes a difference. Uh, Dave, you've been there, you've been here for, for a while. Uh, is, is the fact that you are in touch with so many uh, popular musicians, I, I don't like to call them popular, just musicians from, from New Orleans, has that impacted the way you play in an orchestra? Uh, you know, it, it sure has. It sure has. I, I, one of the things that has affected me the most was playing some of these non-traditional instruments, whether maracas or guero, and just playing them for you. Because <laughs> other, other conductors, I, you can get away with, with not, I think if you, you know, with your Mexican orchestra, they play these styles and these instruments naturally and they're grown, they're brought up playing them. And what we learn in school is uh, kind of how to play them. You know, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's how I view it, that I, I kind of learned how to play it and I, I kind of just fake my way through it. Uh, and for a, for a lot of people, it's fine because that's what they know. But there are a lot of times where you didn't want us to play what's written on the page. You want us to play what the piece, the piece traditionally would be. And that was just something that, you know, we had to overcome that challenge to, to do it. So it's a challenge to ourselves. Um, and, and that's great. It made us better players and yeah. Well, you, one, one thing that's interesting is that you, for example, I, I, I just did a recording well months ago in, in uh, Mexico City that included so many percussion styles because it was music of Paquito de Rivera, uh, Arturo Marquez. It was the, 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 the trumpet concerto that, that you guys did so well. Uh, but it included a, uh, the, the, the Paquito de Rivera trumpet concerto had a Venezuelan joropo that had the, a maracas part that is the hardest maracas part I have ever in, encountered, ever. Plus it was Venezuelan kind of maracas, which means you play vertically and all to the side, you know this. And this, yes, this, uh, no Mexican traditional or, or non-traditional musician learns because it's, it's, it's purely Venezuelan and sometimes even Colombia. So the anecdote is that we are kind of stuck in rehearsal because this thing, this, this joropo, just goes incredibly fast. And our maracas player is like, well, trying to see how, but the orchestra is full of Venezuelans who are looking back and saying, oh, I can do it because they know how to do it from a, in the parties they play maracas. Well, one of them who was not Venezuelan, he is actually Paraguayan, Paraguayan, cellist and we had six cellos and we said well maybe we can do with five cellos and the cellist did the maracas part and i showed him the music and he says no 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 don't 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 show me the music i, I don't need it so basically he they started playing the joropo and he started doing his thing which is sometimes rhythmically speaking very sophisticated because it's six eights, but they put four fours in the middle, but without losing the six eight beat. Now, this is something that blew our minds because we knew this guy as a cellist. And this, I don't mean that being a cellist is a lesser thing. It's just that we don't expect a cellist to, you know, stand up and play maracas. And this guy got it from the first time in every single take was supremely good and different, meaning he was doing different things with, with the instrument. So that, that, that goes for, for me to tell you that sometimes uh, one imagines that, well, everyone south of the border will play well, da, da, da. And I would say no, because in Mexico, we have our guiro specialists and the other percussionists in the orchestra that, that they, they prefer not to do it. They give the guiro to the guiro guy. And, you know, the first orchestra I conducted as almost music director, nobody dared play cymbals. 
because it was Antero who played cymbals. And Antero had this amazing, has this amazing sound on the cymbals. He was a very big, large man. And, you know, those were, so it, it and in, in the National Symphony, if I asked one of the percussionists to switch from guiro to bass drum, there would be mutiny in the percussion section because those parts have been done by these people for like 20, 30 years. So it's not that I know how to play that, is that if I do one thing is I learn by watching these people uh, and sometimes it's something I can't describe. And sometimes it, it, it means like maybe go to hear a Latin, Latin cumbia band and see how the person who is playing Guido is playing Guido for about two hours nonstop and doesn't even look at anything other than the people and it's you know, probably counting time to see when is his break and whatever. But that's the origin of how you learn to play Guido. Uh, so now I'd like to change the topic into one thing which we kind of touch upon already, which is our crazy percussion program at Carnegie Hall. And I'd like to ask Jim to um, tell us what that program was and what kind of challenge what was that for you? Well, the, the big piece for me on the program was the glass double concerto, the double timpani concerto, which I had fortunately played several times before, uh, but not in Carnegie Hall. <laughs> So the just the prospect of playing it in Carnegie Hall with Philip Glass in the audience uh, raised the bar like way up here. So I worked on it for basically two. I worked on a piece that I already knew and had played several times and was comfortable with it. I worked on it for two years from scratch. And uh, one thing I was determined is that I was not going to walk out on the stage of Carnegie Hall and be nervous about anything. I wanted this piece to be such a part of me that no matter what happened, I could, it was going to be okay. And, 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 and uh, okay. so what the, 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 the piece with the smallest percussion component in that program was actually the Philip Glass two timpani fantasy. Is that right? For the percussion section. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I was going to say the other fly in the ointment about that was the encore that you <laughs> mentioned, uh, which was a fantastic piece. I loved the piece. Uh, unfortunately, the timpani part was uh, a gazillion times more difficult than the Philip Glass part. And we got the parts, what, five weeks before we went to Carnegie Hall. And uh, so that was that was another adventure. But I'm so glad we did that. I, I'm glad we got a chance to premiere that piece. It's uh, so great. It, it actually made a very big impression. And uh, I, I have to tell you that the way you and Paul Jancic played the, the fantasy is again, a similar experience from what I described before with Mr. Abel, because it was exciting, it was clean, and it was emotional. I remember especially uh, a place in the second movement that was just so absolutely rapturous how you guys got the sound together and then you 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 really made that piece very very special for the audience uh in the first part we did a piece that i'm used to doing in the second part which is the night of the mayas la noche de los mayas by revueltas and uh jacob assembled a star cast <laughs> because what do i mean by star cast well the, the we normally use our percussion section and some guests well dave was out because of an injury um and unfortunately uh, and that's just life so you had to invite how many guest percussionists maybe 10 11 <laughs> 12 12 total and then a the uh, conch shell player, which was our one of our trombonists. So 12 total, including myself. Well, and uh, 
I, I, we just got a, a message from Julian Romero, who is a timpanist from the National Symphony of Mexico, who came to New Orleans and who I miss. Hola, Julian, gracias por estar conectado. Uh, so the, the, the issue here is that we are not used to getting 10, 11 percussion uh, experts, and we are not used to putting on stage 10 or 11 or 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 percussionists. So uh, that piece has also an improvisation, which is uh, a really cool part of it. And I just remember that it really rocked. It really worked very well. So part, part of the job of, of our musicians in the orchestra uh, is to actually find musicians to come and play the part where we don't have musicians for those parts. And that, that program, every single piece in that program uh, needed something odd or something extraordinary. And also something that's very much your territory is placement on stage. And that's something that I learned the hard way because I used to think that, well, going from piece A to piece B is just so, so, okay, now we go. But I've learned that, well, a piece like the Night of the Mayas has a different setup than a piece like Wapango, for example. And you, when the conductor says, okay, now we switch pieces, what I normally see back there in the percussion section is this mad scramble, okay, where you start like, moving instruments around and all this and then and, and then I get this little message kind of either directly or indirectly saying could you request him to take a break if he is going to go from this piece to this piece and that's how I've learned things like well you need to move things around and we've done some wacky programs in New Orleans which involved all this moving around and Carnegie Hall program was one of those because we had to take so, so many percussion instruments and just placing the two timpani on in front of the orchestra, that's in itself already a challenge. Jim, t t remind us how many drums are there in each, in each of the two soloist parts? Um, I think I used seven timpani and I think Paul used eight timpani, a lot of timpani. And uh, yeah, that was a challenge. And, and you were very gracious in letting us, our suggestion was that we just set up the timpani for the concert in front of the orchestra. Not the most visually pleasing thing, but it's really what we needed to do. And uh, you went along with it and it helped us a lot, especially in New York. Well, I mean, I'm just, in, in, in matters that have to do with percussion, I'm, uh, I will always be learning from you because it's so, it's so unique. And uh, on a conversation uh, with Gabriela Jimenez, she was telling me about Beethoven and the timpani and how difficult it is to get the right stroke on something like Beethoven 9. Uh, and I, I consider Beethoven 9 the ultimate test of a timpanist is would you agree with me there absolutely it's it's it, every every measure in the piece has something <laughs> special about it it's uh, fraught with danger everywhere but it's a, of course an amazing piece a very gratifying piece to play well uh, but yeah it's a challenge and uh going back to dave do you remember one time we did uh Porgy and Bess, do you remember this? I do, yeah. Okay, and actually what I remember is the following, is that whenever that, Porgy and Bess has this beginning, which is a very famous xylophone part that maybe when, when Gershwin play, uh, wrote it, perhaps made xylophone players just go crazy. And since then it's made everyone go crazy. And it's the maybe the single most used uh, excerpt in auditions, I would say, maybe one of the two or three. And I just remember you just rock 
you just played that thing just straight amazing oh, and thank you. well uh, I, huh? I remember you making an announcement to the orchestra that that i've been practicing this part my entire life to just listen to me well so, it, you I, know, I appreciate that it made my life easier yeah there's two reasons for this and they're both practical one is that if you ever look up it's going to be one time maximum which is i think one bar or two before i think you are all trained to look up two bars before and then to beat yourself you know to beat a one bar right before you play but during that passage you're probably not looking up so you know and and, and you're, you're just going so i like to tell orchestras to please just follow the xylophone player because first of all it's by far the person in the orchestra who knows that excerpt the best because no violinist practices this yet you know that it includes violins and that normally violinists look back to you like are you going crazy because they do not practice this i mean or maybe they do but they see gershwin porgy and bess and they see something that they may know yet they have to pretty much do the same notes that you play uh, and that you've been playing all all your life so i i made that announcement for two reasons one because it's it's true they have to follow you and second so that they just you know keep in mind well that they need to practice <laughs> that's <laughs> a very important thing because if they if they fall behind it's not you know it's not anything it's 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 their fault and so many things in percussion to me are like i must be so difficult for you because you practice something at home on a certain beat and then the orchestra starts and changes that for you so i want to i want to talk about bolero okay <laughs> because that's another piece that everyone knows that everyone uh loves to hear and that percussionists have a let's say uh unique relationship with it so um jacob okay i'd like to ask you uh how often have you played bolero uh, just, the one, just the one week with you okay and like what if if i if correct me if i'm wrong what starts to happen is that at the beginning we all go with you maybe the flutist goes with you maybe uh clarinet goes with you bassoon but then little things start happening right like like mm. forces pull you back and forth so what do you do you have to expect <laughs> that i mean that's gonna happen um and i think that my teacher always told me that so i remember his exact words but you have to be you have not an assassin but you have to be like an <laughs> illusion you have to be an illusionist or you have to be this kind of magician with parts that keep a steady beat constantly and are really honest meaning short sounds so bolero if whoever's playing the melodic solo takes time it sounds really expressive but if i take time with the ostinato i sound wrong so what i do to prepare for that is a month before every day twice a day one in the morning one in the afternoon i just pick a recording at random and play <laughs> and play along with it so you know there's only so much you know margin of difference odds are that somebody's going to make the, a similar choice and you know and then trust in the conductor to always give you a downbeat when you reset that first bar. <laughs> <laughs> so what's what's you know? the hardest thing? Is it because if I were to say what's the hardest thing about bolero, from an ignorant perspective of the conductor, I would say the first bar. Mm. I think for me, uh, because I don't I don't feel nervous when you conduct 
meaning that you not that you make me feel really comfortable when you give entrances and it's there's a lot of trust trust there so the i was that's the what i was most worried about having never played it before not having tenure at the time like, <laughs> <laughs> i was i was very worried about that but you were very calm very trusting and very helpful and so I've practiced it a million times. All I need to do is trust in you and play the first note. And, you know, the rest of it kind of just clicks into gear because we've done it so much. Um, for me, the hardest part is, as you said, when the when you get about three minutes into the piece, people start to loosen up a little bit and more and more um, people feel the spirit more and more. <laughs> and so it gets in increasingly tricky to kind of manipulate things uh, within this one path we're, t we're all on, so. In, in my experience, that area is somewhere between the saxophones and the trombone. Yeah, <laughs> that's so about right. <laughs> I know just from experience, because I've, I've done this piece more times than I've should admit because it's done so much in mexico and sometimes with with dancers without dancers on you know whatever so i know that there's a moment at which i say okay we're home free which is basically maybe right after the trombone solo and uh, after the trombone solo when strings start having the tune they do play around with the beat, sometimes pulling back the beat, but for the, for, for it, it's, it, it becomes easy uh, to follow them rather than it's one to a part. And you say, well, is this what we call rubato, which literally means stolen time, uh, means you play around time. It must be very uh, difficult for the snare drum player to know whether sometimes the playing around the beat is that the player, the, 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 the soloist is really behind or if she or he is actually playing around the beat. So what I normally would tell somebody young and somebody who would ask my advice, I would say stay steady because if you try to micro follow a solo, you are going to send some curves to that soloist and then you're going to be following each other and it i've had bad experiences with that so that's why if, if if you remember very often what i do is i ask that the snare drum player to come to the fore and and take a bow because the conductor do, does very little in that piece and you can really almost get away with doing absolutely nothing if you have a steady snare drum player. And, uh, uh, and well, of course the conductor does something, but the, the snare drum is really the uh, soul of, the, of, that, of that piece. Uh, there are other pieces that me as a conductor, I just simply cannot understand how you get to learn to do these pieces. Something like the snare drum part in Scheherazade, for example. And I'd like to ask Dave about this because Scheherazade is a very beautiful piece that we do so often and where people in the orchestra, your colleagues are relaxed and enjoy is always when you get the hardest music, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so uh, what, what is the hardest part about Scheherazade and the snare drum? Well, pro I mean, probably the third movement just before the clarinet solo. And it's just a little short transition until the clarinet comes in and- Two bars. Yeah. So that part, and actually it's the bar before the snare drum comes in is, I mean, for me, that was always the scariest spot. Once you start playing, it, it was it was fine. A, a, a colleague of mine, a very fine timpanist, 
who is now a, a, a conductor and educator by the name of Michael Garassi. I don't know if Michael may be watching or not, but Michael and I were at the Pierre Montes school together. And when we, we, we were staying at the same house, so we were living together. And he basically taught me uh, Petrushka. He taught me, he taught me the five eighth part in Petrushka. He taught me the, the you know, Dan Sacral in, in Rider Spring. And he taught me some really useful things for uh, Scheherazade. And I wrote, I wrote them in, in my score. And one of them is that two bars before that passage that you are referring to, smile at the, at, at, you know, smile at the percussionist. So I put a smiley face on my, on my music, which is there. And it refers to sometimes in 1995, when Michael told me, just look up and smile because that is the place everyone dreads. So you answered ex exactly what I imagined you would answer. Um, and there's so, so many things about the standard repertoire that to people out there seem that it's easy, but when you try it, it's hard. And I would say that what everyone says from the audience, I can do that, is the triangle. You've probably heard this before. Oh, oh, you know, please invite me to your orchestra. At least I can play the triangle. Okay, well, next time I have somebody do that, I'm gonna ask them to play the triangle in Liszt Piano Concerto number one, right? <laughs> Which would be catastrophic. So playing the triangle is hard for all of you who are not percussionists. Playing anything is hard because there's one thing I just have to tell you, I always think about it is that you have to be mind readers, not only of conductors, but also of wind players, of brass players, of string players, because sometimes down is one, and sometimes down is one, and sometimes down is one, and sometimes, okay. So that is where experience helps. Uh, and I can imagine that the first time you played something like, let's say pictures at an exhibition, Mussorgsky, uh, there's famous uh, bass drum. Uh, and I've done this with young orchestras and I would say that nine out of 10 times, the first time that one of these young kids will play these is going to be before the orchestra. Can, can you tell me, Jim, why this phenomenon and how do you how do you adjust to this phenomenon it's it's a really interesting thing it's uh it's the delayed beat which everyone seems to play with and i can remember learning it in mexico actually in the orchestra philharmonica de la ciudad de mexico uh i didn't have that thing programmed in yet and i played a gazillion entrances too long and my mantra finally became on those big entrances where you get the downbeat and there's that incredible silence was to wait, wait, <laughs> and then wait a little bit more and then play. And it was always perfect. <laughs> and I have no idea how to teach that. So that, that you learn by playing in an orchestra, correct? That you learn by making a lot of mistakes, yes. And, and, that, and one thing... One thing is is that if you're going if you're early playing the snare uh, if you're early playing the bass drum, you're going to get a nasty look from somebody. You know that. Uh, yet uh, what you have just told us is completely true. And one thing I tell also young people is know who you play with for, for because if if that bass drum hit is with the tuba you're gonna have to wait a little bit longer than if it's with the violins, for example, where they produce, or, or if it's a piano. Uh, and, and I would say that one of the most fascinating things for me uh, in, in, in my career is, is watching you guys, percussionists, timpanists, adjust to this. And it's, it's an adjust, adjustment that's almost 
piece by piece because every piece is different. And uh, we've done Rise of Spring together. We've done Petrushka together. And you, I've learned from you because sometimes you approach me and that's something I'm very grateful of. You approach me and you very nicely tell me, are you trying to do a rallentando here? And I'm reading minds. I'm saying, mm, that's exactly what I don't want to do. So I then rechange my chip and I say, well, instead of following or instead of leading here, I have to be steady with somebody in the percussion because there are many pieces, many pieces by even living composers. John Adams is one very famous uh, American composer where the orchestra is playing all around the beat, unsteady rhythms, unsteady meters, and somebody is playing, somebody always in the percussion is playing tan, 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 tan. And we've done pieces like that and we've, we've really nailed them. So that speaks very, very highly uh, of, of, of all of you. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you've been patient with me and have accepted to do so many weird, uh, weird pieces. I, it's, for me, it's, an, it's, it's always great because, uh, and, and because I get from you a precision and a quality of playing that is world class and i you know i know that i'm going to ask you for that extra which dave was talking about but you're already giving it so it's kind of the best case scenario uh, and i think that one of the things that we will do when we come back to from this nightmare you know or this whatever we call this thing is do small ensemble pieces so expect to do percussion pieces with small ensemble, whatever you want to do. Uh, and we're going to learn from it and we're going to enjoy it. We're getting up there in time, uh, but I'd like to ask you, is there anything that we haven't spoken about that you would really like to share, Jim? No, I don't think so. I've, I've enjoyed this. It's interesting to hear you talk about percussion and what percussion looks like from where you stand as opposed to where we're standing. I enjoyed this. Thank you. <laughs> Jacob. Uh, I think we covered a lot. You were just talking about, you were just talking about John Adams. My first concert, first rehearsal ever with the LPO was short ride in a fast machine. And I can tell you that my neighbors are probably sick of hearing me play quarter note wood blocks for hours on end. <laughs> but that was really fun. And that's a, uh, you know, for, for a first show, that was a, uh, it was it was quite a lot, but it was good. As they all were, they were all good. So. And Dave. No, I think we touched on it. Yeah, I was did, looking did forward. You, I was looking yeah. forward next season to play the finally getting to play the Carmen Fantasy. Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there, and don't you know? Trust trust that we will. Uh, did you? Were you you were in the orchestra when we played uh, Adam's harmony, Larry? Didn't didn't yes. you? Yes. Yes. Didn't you play one of the marimba parts? Marimba, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I also remember you you did so amazing, and that's a very hard part. That was that, yeah. That was that was a hard. There's a xylophone part in there that was a little bit harder, just because we took a pretty fast tempo and it was four mallet xylophone that is about all I could play but <laughs> well as 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 every time I have one of these conversations I I I learn so much uh I learned so much from you uh I've known the three of you for for a while I've I've missed you tremendously I miss your energy I miss your enthusiasm your incredible ability and, and, and warmth. And I will never cease to say that I'm like the luckiest person alive when I'm in front of the Louisiana Philharmonic because it's an orchestra that's not only incredibly professional, but also understanding, generous, friendly, human. And uh, 
we, we have challenges ahead as every single orchestra has. And I think that the attributes that I just spoke about, gen generosity um, in an orchestra are going to be essential. Uh, and also in our supporters. And the fact that there are people like you in the orchestra and there are people like your other 60 something colleagues uh, gives us a very good chance to excel because we're going to touch the hearts of people who want to help others. I'd like to finish by asking you one very simple question and it's not a trick question. Do you teach in New Orleans, Jim? Yes, I, I've taught at Loyola since 1988, actually, and taught a lot of people. Jacob, do you teach? I teach privately and at the University of New Orleans. Dave, do you teach? Yes, I, I also teach at Loyola. Okay, so um, I this wasn't a this wasn't a quiz question. I knew the answer. I I just want to send the message that the LPO and its musicians are have a trickle down effect in the community that is huge. If we were to add the number of students that you three have had over the years or of students of students that you have had, it would be a huge number. So when people look at the LPO, and they look at an orchestra that plays subscription concerts, they're doing the right thing, but partially. They should also look at a great group of educators and leaders and people who make a personal, incredible difference in a community. And that's why I'm committed to fight as hard as I can when we're back hopefully in September, to make an impact in that amazing city because I know you and I know that we have a great, great orchestra. So thank you very much for spending an hour with me. Thank you very much for talking with me and uh, hopefully see you in September. I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to go to New Orleans in, in August uh, to do work. So if things allow us to say hi from close or not so close, we will, but please stay safe. Say hi to your spouses because uh, I know all three, I value all three and I've worked with all three and I adore them as much as I adore you. So thank you very much. And thank you for all our audience. Thank you for all your love and see you next week. Bye-bye.